So um, this is sort of the part two to the Doctrine of Imminency video that I did um, just prior to this one. And I want to talk about the reasons why the Doctrine of Imminency is kind of not scriptural. Okay, why it, it goes against the revealed Word of God, the other things that we know about God and how he does things. Okay, so, um, and we're going to use some scripture passages for this. So I hope you'll get out your Bibles. I may or may not put them all up on the screen. Uh, the first point I want to make here is that the doctrine of imminency, which states that the rapture could happen at any time, there's no events that need to take place before the rapture happens. It could have taken place any time uh, since Jesus ascended, basically. It, it's uh, something that really, it, there is nothing that has to be done before this event could take place. Not the evangelization of the world or really... Uh, there's no event, which to me is like when you look at the things that Jesus told his disciples that they were to do to go out into all the world and preach the gospel um, and make disciples who would actually do the same thing, that they would make uh, preach the gospel and make disciples too, that this was something that was going to spread and it needed to spread throughout the world, that that couldn't happen. Just the thought of that is kind of ludicrous, that the rapture could have happened early, early, early on, okay? And we'll get into some other scripture passages that indicate that it, the uh, early church, the early apostles, did not believe that they would be raptured in an imminent kind of way. Okay. So the early apostles uh, believed that the rapture had to have certain signs that preceded it, okay? Now, the first thing I want to draw our attention to, though, is that imminency um, that we don't know. It could happen anytime, and we have to always be ready, okay, be on our guard um, for his return. Uh, this goes against the character of God, okay, and you'll go, really? How is that? Well, you know, we have a special relationship with the Lord. I mean, it's a really close yeah. one. John 15, 15 is one of my favorite passages where Jesus is talking to his disciples, but this has application to all of us who love the Lord. He says, uh, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So Jesus is saying, look, it's not, I'm not keeping secrets from you anymore. I, I call you my friends. And everything the Father tells me, I'm going to tell you. And that takes us right to Revelation chapter 1. And this is the purpose for the book of Revelation. It's not meant to frighten anyone or scare anyone. It's not even meant to be a, a huge mystery either. This is what it says. Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. So God gave the revelation to Jesus to give to us so that we would know what was going to take place because he's called us his friends. And everything he tells Jesus, Jesus is telling us. Okay, He doesn't hide this stuff from us. Which then takes us to Amos 3 verse 7. And a lot of you are familiar with this passage. Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. And that is quoted, by the way, uh, in Revelation chapter 10, which is all about the resurrection of the dead and the change of the living. And this is what the mighty angel says, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, that the mystery of God as he announced to his servants, the prophets should be fulfilled. So the things that God announced to his servants, the prophets, which is really the announcement and the proclamation written in the book of Revelation. This is what he announced. And at the end of everything being fulfilled, that's when the seventh trumpet would blow. So God's nature and character is to share with us as his children the things that he's doing. He doesn't want us to be in the dark about any of this stuff. He wants us to know. And he's given us the information in the book of Revelation. He's called us his friends. He tells Jesus what's happening and Jesus tells us. Another passage in John chapter 16. We read about how the Holy Spirit 
was going to come. And one of the reasons for the Holy Spirit to come and indwell uh, believers was so that he could inform us of things that are about to take place. John 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And remember, the whole book of John is a bit of a commentary on Revelation. And we understand Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation, a lot of it is in the light of what we read in the Gospel of John. There are echoes of Revelation all over in this Gospel. And one of them is that uh, the Holy Spirit, he's not going to speak on his own authority. He's going to speak what he hears from Christ and from the Father and declare to us the things that are to come. If you have the Holy Spirit, you can know what's coming. There is nothing that's a secret to you. Okay, so we're given the prophetic word as revealed in the book of Revelation. And Peter talks about the prophetic word being a light to our feet. So, Second Peter chapter 1, uh, starting with verse 19. And we have the prophetic word made more sure. And you do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What this is saying is that there's the prophetic word going out. And as we understand it, it becomes a light that shines uh, in the path in front of us so we know how to walk. And eventually the day is going to dawn and the morning star will rise in our hearts, okay? But prophecy is not a matter of our own interpretation. The Holy Spirit is the one who has to give us the interpretation of the prophetic word. Okay, so that's super important. And one of the ways he does that is he draws our attention to passages. He um, gives us understanding. He helps us to compare scripture with scripture. He poses questions to us like, um, what about the doctrine of imminency? Is there anything in the scriptures that talk about that? And as you look, you go, you know, no, God does not want us in the dark. He wants us uh, to understand these things and the Holy Spirit will give us the meaning of the prophetic word as we look to him. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God and men moved by the Holy Spirit understand what this means, okay, and women too. All right, so the second point I want to make here is that there are events which needed to happen first before the rapture, okay? In the Bible, we know that there are certain events that will take place. They must take place because they were prophesied, and so they will take place. So the first event which needed to happen, that must happen before there could be a rapture of believers, is the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, and that happened in 70 AD. Okay, and the destruction of Jerusalem was prophesied by Christ. He said that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another in the book of Matthew. And also in Luke 19, I want to just really quick take a look at that. And if we start with verse 41, and when Jesus drew near the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that even today you knew the things that make for peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will cast up a bank about you and surround you and hem you in on every side and dash you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So this is actually um, prophesied also in Daniel chapter 9, I think it's verse 26, where the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, Jesus, um, basically, I'm sure he knew that passage in Daniel chapter 9, and when the Jews rejected him, he said, that's what's going to happen. The, there's going to be people who will come in, and they're going to destroy the city. So this prophecy um, that Jesus prophesied and Daniel prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem was going to take place before there was a rapture. Okay, so, um, and then 
there can't be uh, these end time events that we're looking to until we have the regathering of Israel, which Jesus also prophesied in, in those same passages in, in Matthew 24, that the fig tree would leaf out, that Israel would come back together again, and that the generation that sees this would also see Jesus at the door. Okay, that, that's the time frame of his coming. But there were events that needed to take place. Number one, the, the fall of Jerusalem, and then the regathering of Jerusalem before the end time events would play out. All right, so this was the first one, which is basically the destruction of Jerusalem would take place before there would be any rapture. And then the regathering would have to take place before the second coming of Christ. And you have to understand that the rapture is in the context of the second coming. The rapture is a part of the second coming stuff. It's not totally divorced from it. So uh, this is why even people who are dispensational, you know, pre-trib, believe in imminency, get so excited when they saw the regathering of Israel. Because even people who believe in imminency understand that the rapture is in the context of the larger second coming of Christ. Okay, so uh, Peter also knew that he would not be raptured because Jesus told Peter he was going to die. So this is in John chapter 21, uh, verses 17 through 19, and this is a story most of us are familiar with. You know, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Peter, do you even like me? You know, Lord, you know all things. And this is what Jesus said. He said, Truly I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and you walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said, follow me. So it was a second call to Peter. But Jesus told Peter that Peter was going to die. He's going to actually be old. He says, you're young. You go where you want to. You're going to be old and you're going to die by crucifixion. You're going to stretch out your hands, and someone's going to take you where you don't want to go. So we know Peter was going to die before Jesus returned. Then Peter saw John, and he says, what about him? And, you know, is he going to die? And Jesus said, that's none of your business, basically, what happens to John? So verse 22 in John chapter 21, Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. And so the saying spread abroad among the brethren that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he wouldn't die. But if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So in other words, John knew that he didn't have a guarantee uh, against death, okay, that he would uh, stay alive until the second coming. But a lot of people... Uh, there was this rumor that was going on at that time that you just watch John, okay, and he won't die until Jesus returns. And John put that baby to bed and said, no, that's not true. That isn't what Jesus said. I can die and Jesus may not come. And there's no guarantee that if you watch me, Jesus will come before I die. Okay, so and of course, Revelation was written about 95 A.D., so the temple had been destroyed. They'd seen that prophecy, um, but Israel hadn't been regathered yet, okay? And the book Gospel of John, I think, was written after um, Revelation. There are, are many people out there who also agree with that, that Revelation was first and then the Gospel of John. Peter knew for sure he was going to die. Paul knew he was going to die, okay? There's a place where, uh, a passage where, People talk about how Paul was including himself in people who would be raptured. But there came a time when Paul said, you know, I'm going to die. I've run my course. The race is over. Okay, so the passage is in 2 Timothy 4, and this is 6 through 8. He said, for I'm already on the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure or death has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. All right, so Paul knew that it was, it was the end for him, and that he would receive his crown later on. 
okay, on the day when Christ appeared. Okay, so the third thing is that, and I've already touched on this, but I'll just state it again, is that the rapture of believers is in the context of end times. So when we look at the book of Revelation and we're understanding, you know, the rapture of the child to the throne room of God and the 24 elders and all of that, it's all in the context of the end times. So to divorce uh, the idea of the rapture from end times that it, it's just foolishness, really, it's just foolishness, because the raptures are in the context of the end times, and particularly in the context of a regathered Israel, okay? And that's really the, the big um, starting point here is when the fig tree leafed out. That gives us our 70 to 80 year generation. So really, um, you can boil down the rapture will have to happen within this 70 to 80 year generation. And I start their end time generation in 1947 with the UN uh, resolution to create this nation state in one day. So uh, Psalm 90 verse 10 tells us a generation is between 70 and 80 years. Add the upper limit of 80 years to 1947 and you get 2027. So the second coming of Christ has to happen before 2027. Some people say 2028, but we're, we're in the realm of that period of time. And I know a lot of people will say that the rapture, it can happen now, any day now, any day now, any day now. And that's not true either because the rapture is part of the end time uh, plan of God. And remember this first point I made here, we're called his friends. He's going to let us know. And so when we read Revelation, we understand Revelation is a story of priests and the temple, the heavenly temple, and how uh, the rotation of priests goes into the heavenly temple when they go in. And of course, we tell time in temple time, which uh, goes by the rotation of the feast, the, the feast cycle, the feasts of the Lord. That's temple time. That's how we know when things are going to happen. And the other way, of course, is by the sign that God put in the sky, in the starry heavens, um, with the Revelation 12 sign in 2017. The idea that the rapture could happen at any time and that even people during the apostolic era believed that the rapture could happen at any time, that is not true. They didn't believe that. They knew certain events needed to take place first. Now, I want to take a look at um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 really quickly. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Now concerning the coming, or the parousia, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to meet him, we beg you, brethren, do not be quickly shaken in mind or excited either by spirit or word or by letter purporting to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. And by the way, the day of the Lord is synonymous with the wrath of God, but it is not synonymous with the whole seven years that people say it is, okay? The day of the Lord is not seven years long. So let no one deceive you in any way. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay, some will say unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay, okay. so the apostasy or rebellion is synonymous with the revelation of the man of sin. The apostasy or rebellion, that is the Antichrist doing his own thing and becoming the lawless one with no restraint at all, doesn't happen until the abomination of desolation. It's only 42 months, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. So he's saying, don't let anyone deceive you because the man of sin has to be revealed first, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember when I was with you, I told you this? And you know what's restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. That is not the Holy Spirit living inside of believers. The one who restrains the Antichrist, it can only be God. God is the only one who has the power to keep the Antichrist from being revealed. And then the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. So Paul is saying, don't be deceived, okay? 
The day of the Lord will not come until the man of sin is revealed. The day of the Lord will not come until the man of sin is revealed. And what Paul is connecting here is a, a rapture which will occur just prior to the day of the Lord. Okay, if you only believe in one rapture, this is all is a very convoluted way you, you make this passage work. But if you know that there's more than one rapture, because there's more than one rotation of priests into the heavenly temple, this is the third rapture. This is the one that happens after the man of sin takes his seat in the temple of God, simultaneously with the beginning of the day of the Lord, okay, or the wrath of God, all right? So if we were to look at this on a timeline, okay, let's just put the midpoint right here. This is when the abomination of desolation takes place, okay? And so the day of the Lord can't come until the man of sin is revealed. So the day of the Lord does not come, okay? The wrath of God does not come at the beginning of his seven years. It comes after the man of sin is revealed, and then the rebellion begins, okay? The official reign of the Antichrist is that rebellion, okay? The lawless one. He's a rebel, okay? <laughs> All right, and then you have the second coming here at the end of the seven years. Okay, but after the man of sin is revealed, there is the rapture. That's the third one. And then this is the day of the Lord, also known as the wrath of God. And this takes place on a day that we don't know, the day or the hour. All we know is it's after the abomination of desolation, but before the day of the Lord and before the second coming of Christ. Okay, so this is 42 months right here. The reign of the beast is a full 42 months. The tribulation of those days is cut short. Okay, tribulation is one thing. That's persecution. It'll be cut short right here. And then the day of the Lord will begin. And this rapture right here is in conjunction with the beginning of the day of the Lord. I hope I've demonstrated with enough evidence here that, and scriptural evidence, that you know, you can point to and go, yeah, that's true. Peter had to die first. And yes, Paul knew he was going to die. And yes, there had to be the destruction first. And then there ha also has to be a regathering. <laughs> okay. We know all these things okay. are in the scriptures and we can read them. They're there in black and white. And we don't have to read anything into those passages at all. Okay. We don't have to read anything into it. Imminency is not a scriptural idea. The rapture cannot happen at any time. It happens in the context of the last days of the end times. And the book of Revelation tells us all about how this is going to work. Get my book, okay? A Kingdom of Priests, the stories of Revelation. It's all in there. Or if all you want is the condensed version, get my uh, shorter book. It's only, it's under 40 pages and it has all the timelines in it, okay? It's called the, A Kingdom of Priests, the timelines of Revelation. All this is free. Just download it, you know, get it, put it in your hands, uh, put it on a thumb drive and send it to somebody, okay? Uh, time is getting really, really short and Christians are believing all kinds of things that are not uh, based in scripture and it could be, uh, it could spell trouble for believers and we want believers to be prepared because we're friends of God, okay? He's made us his friends. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments section and we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day. <music>